So, what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? Everyone knows that all women have XX chromosomes and all men have XY chromosomes, right? Well, not so fast. Did you know that some women have XY chromosomes? These women have altered Y chromosomes and can go through their entire life never knowing that they're different from any other woman. Some women are mosaics, with some of their cells having two XX chromosomes and others having one X chromosome. Some have three X chromosomes. So there's a whole spectrum of chromosome types that can happen. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> so if being a woman isn't about chromosomes, then what is it about? Being feminine, getting married, having kids? You don't have to look far to find amazing women who don't want to be feminine, who aren't married, who don't want kids. But we all share something that makes us women. Maybe that something is in our brains. You might have heard old-fashioned theories about men being better in math than women because they have bigger brains. Well, these theories have been debunked. The average man has a brain about three times smaller than the average elephant, but that doesn't mean the average man is three times dumber than the average elephant. Or does it? There's a new wave of female neuroscientists that have shown important differences in the brain between females and males, in neuron connectivity, in brain structure, in brain activity. They're finding that the brain is a mosaic built of many female-typical and male-typical patches. Men mostly have male patches, and women have mostly female patches. So with all this new data, what does it mean to be a woman? Well, this is something I've thought about my entire life, possibly more than anyone in this room. When people learn that I'm a woman who happens to be transgender, they always ask, how do you know you're a woman? Well, as a scientist, I've been searching for the answer to this question uh, my entire life to try to find a biological basis of gender. I want to understand what makes me, me. Well, new discoveries at the very front edge of science are revealing the physiology that determines gender, the biomarkers. My colleagues and I are studying the physiology, the neuroscience, and the genetics to try to figure out exactly how gender works. <clears throat> Oops. <laughs> so there, these vastly different fields share a common connection, and this is called epigenetics. In epigenetics, this is sort of a fancy word for saying that DNA is more than just a sequence. Actually, the shape of DNA determines uh, what happens during gene expression. In epigenetics, we study how uh, gene expression works, how the shape of the DNA can alter how genes express themselves. <clears throat> okay, sorry. So it turns out that uh, the shape of DNA is actually critical in determining essentially how genes can be programmed um, all the way from the womb to the end of a baby's life. And this is turning into a very f rapidly growing business. Um, right now, the value of epigenetics is uh, estimated to be about $5 billion, and it's uh, projected to quadruple in the next few years. <clears throat> So you can think of uh, DNA as basically a long string-like molecule that winds up inside your cells. There's so much DNA that it gets tangled into these knot-like things. We call them knots. Well, it turns out that the way our DNA is wound up or even knotted can change the way our genes express themselves. External factors in our life can change the tightness and the shape of these knots. You can think of it like this. Inside our body, there are trillions of cells, and each of them is like a tiny microscopic city with millions of contraptions busily doing their things, making life happen, moving 
pieces from here to there, from there to here, fixing parts, mixing potions, fighting infections. Here's one that carries a sack of neurotransmitters. So this carries neurotransmitters from one end of the brain cell to the other. This one is something that I've studied since 2001, an entire molecular factory. This is called the ribosome. Some say it's the secret of life. <clears throat> well, one of the stunning things that is... <clears throat> One of the stunning things about this is that the individual contraptions inside each cell are biodegradable. They dissolve, but new ones are made each day, like a traveling circus where circus structures are taken down and put back together. A difference between our cells and the circus is this. For the traveling circus, skilled craftsmen rebuild the circus. Inside our cells, there are no skilled craftsmen, only simple, dumb molecular machines. These dumb mach machines build what's written in the plans, no matter what they say. These plans are actually the DNA, the instructions to build every nook and cranny in our cells. Well, if almost everything in, say, our brain cells dissolve every day, then how can the brain remember anything past one day? Well, that's where DNA comes in. DNA is one of the things that does not dissolve. However, to remember that something happens, the DNA has to record that event by changing itself when the event happened. But it's not the sequence of the DNA that changes. If that happened, then we might grow a new ear or a new eyeball every day. So instead, the DNA changes shapes. And that's where those knots we talked about a minute ago come into play. You can think of them like DNA memory. So when something happens to you, like a childhood trauma, stress hormones flood the brain. These hormones don't change the sequence of your DNA but they do change the shape. The burst of hormones affects the piece of DNA containing instructions for molecular machines that reduce stress. This piece of DNA gets tied into knots. Then the dumb builder machines can't access the DNA and can't build the stress-reducing machines. The terrible thing is that these DNA knots persist. While parts of our cells are being torn down and rebuilt, the DNA knots created by an environmental signal such as a hormone persist, sometimes for our entire life. So the sequence of the DNA remains the same, but its shape changes. It responds to hormones, tying itself up into knots. And this is how DNA remembers what happens in the past. So that's what happens at the micro scale. On the micro, macro scale, you lose the ability to deal with stress, and that's bad. And if these DNA knots persist, your system can lose the ability to deal with stress for your entire life. Well, I believe that's what happened to me when I started gender transition. Even though I was a woman on the inside and I wore women's clothes on the outside, everyone saw me as a man in a dress. In science, where credibility is everything, people were snickering in the hallways, giving me stares, looks of disgust, afraid to be near me. I remember my first conference talk after transition. It was in a small town in Europe in a large cathedral remodeled into a conference center. I'd given talks at prestigious conferences before, but at this one, I was terrified. I looked out into the audience, and the whispers started, the smirks, the looks, the chuckles. To this day, I still have social anxiety about those events eight years ago. I felt like no matter how many surgeries I had, even if I were indistinguishable from a typical woman in every way, most people would never acknowledge me as the woman that I was. I lost hope. Well, don't worry, I've had therapy, so I'm okay now. I'm okay. But I said, enough is enough. I'm a scientist. I have a doctorate in astrophysics. I've published in the top journals in space physics, wave particle interactions, nucleic acid biochemistry. I've been trained to get to the bottom of things. So I went online. I found fascinating research papers. I learned that DNA knots are not always bad. In fact, nodding and unnodding is like a complex computer language that programs our bodies with exquisite precision. When we get pregnant, our fertilized egg 
grows and develops into a newborn embryo. During this process, an enormous number of DNA decisions are made. Should each cell in the embryo become a heart cell, a blood cell, a brain cell? And each decision occurs at a different time during pregnancy, some in the first trimester, some in the second, and some in the third. To truly understand DNA decision-making, we need to see the DNA knots in atomic detail to know how those knots form. But even the most powerful microscopes cannot see this. Well, what if we use computers to simulate all the atoms in the DNA knot system? Well, DNA, this would require one billion atoms. So for each of those billion atoms, we need to calculate the forces due to the other 999 million atoms on that first atom, and then do the same for all the other atoms. On your laptop, this would take about a million years. Well, what if we connected a million laptops together? This is just what we have at Los Alamos Laboratory the Trinity supercomputer, about a million processor cores hooked together in a giant state-of-the-art warehouse. Here we can see the DNA making up an entire gene, twisted into knots of very specific shapes. For the first time, my team has simulated atom for atom an entire gene of DNA, the largest biomolecular simulation to date. We're beginning to answer the unsolved scientific problem, how hormones trigger the formation of DNA knots. Well, DNA decision-making is also seen beautifully in calico cats. The decision between orange and black fur is made early in the womb, so the patchy pattern on the calico cat gives an exact readout of the DNA decisions that were made during embryo development. A similar pattern happens in humans and is important for brain cancer and also intellectual disability. Well, DNA decision during the embryo happens in other parts of the body. It turns out that the precursor genitals transform from male to female during the first trimester, but the precursor brains, on the other hand, transform from male to female during the second trimester. And the current working model is that for women like me, a unique hormone mix in the womb caused the precursor genitals to transform one way and the precursor brain to transform the other way. So to explore this more, you can think of each cell in the growing embryo like a garment of clothing. A baby starts as a single fertilized cell, and then this grows and divides into two cells and into four and so on, and soon we have a ball of many cells that are almost identical, the embryonic stem cells from which all other cell types stem. At some point, the chemical mix inside the cells triggers many kinds of DNA knot formation, making DNA decisions, changing the genes that are expressed and triggering cells to differentiate. So some DNA decisions cause cells to transform into muscle cells, blood cells, and nerve cells, and so on. So if you're completely lost, let's try a different example, like the, the clothes you're wearing right now. So each article of clothing begins as a blank piece of material, uh, but this has the potential to become a skirt, a pair of shorts, a blouse, a shirt, and so on. So as in development of the embryo, Many DNA decisions are made to differentiate the cell to more and more specialized levels of cell, from the endoderm line, the mesoderm line, the ectoderm line of cells, and then more decisions transform these into more specialized lung cells, heart, blood, pancreas, and brain, and so on. And likewise, when a garment is designed, fashion decisions are made, well, whether it will be in the line of shirts, shorts, dresses, pants, and so on, and then the shirts, can go to more feminine or masculine cuts and the pants and so forth. And then similar decisions can proceed to the collars and waistlines and sleeves. So likewise, as the precursor brain in the embryo develops into the actual brain, DNA decisions are made to transform neurocells into neurons, dendrocytes, astrocytes, and further to make the cerebellum, the cerebral cortex, the hypothalamus, and all the different structures in the brain. So in fact, thousands of male-female DNA decisions are made during brain development in the embryo, resulting in a patchwork mosaic. Each baby has a number of masculine patches and feminine patches in their brains. The males tend, on average, to have more masculine patches and the females more feminine patches. And individuals, however, can have a wide variation with some females can have mostly masculine patches and some males could have mostly feminine patches. 
So for women like me, the model is that the hormone mix altered the DNA decision making very early on in the development of the womb. Well, my research into DNA decision making and making some great friends gave me a glimpse of hope. I learned that you can have facial feminization surgery and gender confirmation surgery, and these are risky and irreversible. You know, I could lose my family or my job, I could die. But I found a paper about women like me that have brains more similar to typical cisgender women. I took this to my neuroscientist colleagues, and they were impressed, and I went forward. And now most strangers see me as a woman, and they don't stare, as long as I'm having a great hair day. And today, here I am in my own authentic body. Well, nowadays, people are examining the opposite of stress. Does relaxation affect your DNA in positive ways? Are we missing critical data from mouse models, however? You know, we need to know, do mouse meditate? Could they reach enlightenment like the Dalai Lama or perform Jedi mind tricks like Jedi Master Yoda? Well, having friends and being in a loving relationship has given me the strength to help others. At work, I wear a rainbow bracelet. It helps raise awareness as well. There are so many transgender people, especially women of color, that are one degrading step away from taking their own life. The suicide rate among transgender women is 40%. So if you're out there and you feel like you have no other options, reach out, send an email, go to a support group, get help. So, what does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a man? Well, the research is showing that men and women brains do develop differently in the womb, possibly giving us women that innate sense of being a woman. On the other hand, could it be our shared sense of commonality that gives us this common sense? Well, maybe we're not even asking the right question. It's kind of like asking a calico cat what it means to be a calico cat. Maybe being a woman means accepting ourselves for who we really are and acknowledging the same in each other. I see you, and you've just seen me. Thank you. Wow, what a great talk. Thank you, Carissa, for sharing your story. And I love how you looked at yourself and you started to think about how you were feeling and then how you could apply science to it. I think that's absolutely incredible. And I know I have a lot of questions and I'm sure the audience does as well. Um, so for those who are new or if you're returning, don't forget there's uh, a team walking up and down the aisles where you can ask questions and they've got microphones as well as if it's easier for you because you're a little bit of an introvert, we do have feedback or running as well to ask questions online. Um, so I guess one of the questions that I have for you is you are so smart. Um, and the way that you just translated things, I've never thought about knots before in DNA as an example. Okay. Um, but if there's one thing that you'd want the audience to walk away with today, what would that be? Um, I would say that the concept is that this new field of epigenetics is showing how uh, social interactions and stressful uh, situations can actually change how your DNA is programmed and that can persist throughout your life, especially events in early childhood. Is there any advice that you'd have for someone in terms of how to react to a situation like that or also how to play a role to make sure they're not creating those situations? Um, yeah, I would say that like the, the newest studies, it's sort of um, uh, unprogramming the knots is kind of um, a controversial and uh, cutting edge field now, but some of the studies are showing that meditation and relaxation can, can actually may do your DNA some good. But. Amazing. So I'm just looking out there. Do we have, oh, we've got a question uh, from the fabulous Galit. Hello. Um, so I have a question. Um, there is some progress now and more openness towards uh, gender fluidity and gender identity. Uh, obviously not enough. But what would you ask us, like as individuals here walking away from your talk, what is the one thing that we can do in order to better uh, the understanding about uh, gender 
and genes and what can we do in our everyday lives? I would say if you have any friends who are transgender or gender non-conforming, just try to listen to them and not project your own ideas onto them and just um, try to listen to the words that they say. I'd say. I think that's great advice, actually, for all of us in every situation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I do believe we've got another question from the middle of the audience. Yes, uh, so first of all, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned uh, knots happening in uh, the DNA. I was just curious if these knots uh, persist over generations or if it's uh, just something which affects the, the individu individual themselves. Huh? And, I, that's and a great question. And in some thank studies you. in mice and rats, um, they do see these effects persisting over two or three generations. So with the work that you're doing, um, you've obviously reached the stage that you're at today. What are you hoping to discover as you move forward? And what are you continuing to be curious about? Um, so we're trying to really understand um, how, how these knots form in atomistic detail. And if we have like a, 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 so, so thorough understanding that we can predict how they will form, um, these are really good targets for therapeutics and a lot of the big um, pharmaceutical companies are coming into this area now and the reason is that these effects tend to be very specific to tissue type, developmental stage type and so forth. So it's sort of almost a holy grail for uh, drug development. I love that, the holy grail. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if I'm not mistaken, I saw a hand just back there on the right. Yeah. Hi. Um, yes, I've got a little personal question because I never could ask that question to a sort of an expert and I think you are an expert in this particular um, thing. Um, I'm asking about homosexuality because you're talking a lot about gender and male and female and nots and do you also think that the key to find out where homosexuality yeah. comes out um, also lays in this um, Thing. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. There are, um, there's actually a group in Vienna um, and a few other groups doing uh, functional MRI scans on different individuals to study their brains. And, um, and right now there's only been uh, very few studies on homosexuality, but people are wondering if uh, the, the, there may be difference in the gene expression and in the brain activity as well. Thank you. Thank you. So you were mentioning in your talk um, originally how when you first came out to the science committee uh -huh. or community, you were feeling, um, I'm, I'm going to say, you know, a little bit of pressure or stressed. Yeah. And, um, and you m then mentioned a comment about going through therapy and yeah. jokingly uh -huh. and about feeling much better today. Yeah. Um, what are some tips that you might be able to share with the audience oh. in terms of we all struggle with things? So uh -huh. how have you been able to handle that as just a human being? Yeah, I think finding a good therapist always helps. Um, there is some, you may have to shop around. Some are better than others. Um, but it's, it's always good to talk to someone who's you're not connected to you, who won't really judge you, who won't, you don't have to worry about all the calculations. Like if you're going to confide in your mother or your husband or your wife, there's a lot of other calculations that you do before exposing you know, what you're going to say. But with the therapist, you don't have to worry about that, I'd say. So, uh, and with your scientific yeah. mindset, how do you bring that into those conversations? Like just in yeah. general, about how do you think about the world and uh -huh. then apply science to it? I see. Um, well, I think um, some of the latest studies are, are looking at um, relaxation in general, but there haven't been any studies on the effect of therapy on your DNA yet, but this would be a really exciting new direction, I think. I am just keep checking my app to see if okay. there's any questions, so don't forget that if you want to ask any questions, you can feel free to use Feedbacker. It's a great tool. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, ah, we've got a question up front here. If we could grab the microphone, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm asking because a friend of mine is struggling with her gender and I would like to support her in this very important question and her journey. But she's very scared and also doesn't, um, she doesn't want to be put in a box. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. can I support her? That's a great question. I would say um, try to be there for her as, as much as you can. And um, with the pronoun thing, always ask what pronouns they prefer. And then mm. really practice hard and never, ever make a mistake on that, because it's so painful when people do that, especially the ones close to you. 
And then also there's a lot of um, things you can read online to educate yourself before talking and supporting her. Um, that's really important to do your homework in advance. But the most important thing is try to um, go in with a full heart and, and just be a good friend, you know, and try to li listen. Yeah, it's a great question, some really good advice. Okay. So I think we've got time for one more question from the audience. OK, well, um, obviously, Chris is still going to be around afterwards. So if you want to, you can find her walking around here at the side. Um, I do want to say thank you for being so open and vulnerable um, and sharing not just your story, um, but helping to educate us a little bit more. And then also just being so open to all of the questions that have come up. Sure. Absolutely wonderful. OK, great. Thank you thank so you. much, Chris. Okay. I really appreciate it. Okay.